Hello, everyone, um, and welcome to our Tuesday webinar. This week, we have a very interesting topic and a very current topic um, as we uh, look forward, uh, well, not actually look forward, but we look into the second year of the pandemic um, ahead of us. Uh, we thank you all for joining us and for joining us again uh, during this uh, seminar series. We will focus today on partnerships. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown us all that we cannot um, do it on our own, that we need collaboration, be that across countries or across sectors. As you will have seen from the title of the webinar that brought you here, we want to focus on public-private partnerships for R&D in healthcare and ask ourselves whether the COVID-19 experience will change the game on how such models work in the future. However, it is important to realize that we have had during the pandemic, a range of different partnership agreements. Um, and we will hear about those together with the public-private model um, during our webinar today. What we used to see a lot would, uh, was public-private partnerships in healthcare for areas where it was necessary to harness both the strengths of the public and the private sector to provide solutions where um, the private sector on its own um, had no incentive to act. Uh, for instance, um, for, for diseases that primarily um, plague developing countries, or uh, for instance, for medicines with um, either short uh, duration uh, of use, like antimicrobials or limited target groups. Clearly, the COVID-19 pandemic has changed uh, this, um, and we will look forward to input from very distinguished speakers today um, to show us how the, to show us how this has been um, happening, to explain um, how public-private partnerships have worked so far, to highlight differences to previous responses and explain to us how we have learned from those responses for today's response and how can, we can build on today's response and the lessons we have learned for the future. We will start with a keynote by Barbara Kerstiens from the Commission. We will hear from Vasi Murthy from the WHO from Malta Klebos, from FBA, and from Yanis Natsis from the European Public Health Alliance. And we ask you um, to give us your input and your questions in the chat. The session today will run as follows. Barbara will give us a keynote for about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, before that, we will ask you a poll question. Um, you will hear the results after Barbara's keynote, um, and then we will focus on our spotlight speakers, um, our three contributions from Vasi, Magda and Yanis, um, before opening to a discussion with you um, at the, fin the final 20 minutes of the webinar. So we, before uh, we pass on to uh, Barbara for her keynote, let me uh, pass to my colleague Erica, uh, who will show us today po today's poll questions. Erica, over to you. Thank you, Jimmy. Yes, uh, Annalisa, if you could put the poll questions up on the screen. So this is just to get a feel for um, what you in the audience uh, feel about today's topic. So our first question is, um, are public-private partnerships the solution for R&D and strengthening health systems? That's a simple yes, no question. And then uh, we would like to know what you feel are the key takeaways from the COVID-19 experience regarding R&D and healthcare. And you can choose uh, more than one option here, but you can say what, we can, what we've learned is that anything is possible in the face of a global crisis, that BBPs are essential, but need to be governed better, that they all, that public private partnership, uh, public public, sorry, public public pro partnerships also matter, that international agencies need to play a central role, um, that we need to keep investing in the basics um, and that new outbreaks will happen and it is vital to build on lessons to ensure a better response in the future. So we'll give you the results of the poll after Barbara's uh, given us her overview. Thank you very much. Thank you, Erica, and I think we really look forward to finding out uh, what our participants think. It's now a great pleasure um, to pass on to Barbara Kerstiens from the uh, Unit on Combative Diseases at the People Directorate of the Director General for, for Research and Innovation at the European Commission. Um, Barbara has a long experience in international public health and will talk to us today about public-private partnerships, but also different types of partnerships and how exactly they have functioned during the pandemic. Barbara, over to you. Thank you very much for joining us today. 
Thank you very much, uh, dear, dear colleagues, dear all participants. Uh, I thought it would be useful uh, to uh, start by giving you a state of play of what we uh, as the European Union Commission have invested so far in the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic response, research response, and then move over to, uh, as Dimitra already alluded to, the different type of partnerships that we are involved with and think are important in order to better address the pandemic, but also uh, these partnerships and the different natures of these partnerships can be synergistic with one another. So I will start while waiting for the slides to come. Uh, as I mentioned, um, I will provide an overview of the state of play. And uh, when referring to the different uh, types of partnerships we are involved in, we have the GLOPEDAR network of preparedness research funding. We have uh, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, you're all familiar with. Obviously, uh, the Innovative Medicines Initiative. But we have also some uh, new kids on the block, so to speak. Uh, we are working towards a pandemic preparedness partnership with member states. And then there's the partnership in the make that is called European Partnership on Transforming Health and Care Systems. Yeah, so here you will see uh, what has been invested so far uh, on research response under Horizon 2020, more than 1 billion uh, euro, uh, of which uh, 780 million and a bit have been mobilized so far. We will share these slides with you, but uh, the color coding gives you uh, an idea of which area investments have been made so far, and also the type of uh, institutions or entities that have been involved uh, in the research response. Next slide, please. And I, I thought it would be useful to highlight uh, a few elements that have been uh, put in place uh, since uh, the pandemic started. Uh, we are funding uh, two large scale, uh, three large scale regional clinical trials network, uh, two for therapeutics and with a strong coordination uh, mechanism in place. And then uh, we have just launched Vaccelerate, which is the EU wide uh, clinical trials network for vaccine trials. Sorry. Whoop. Yeah. Uh, we've also funding a, a large cohort and orchestra. And why is that cohort important? Because it will help us uh, answer some of uh, the important questions about how vulnerable groups are affected or how uh, um, the, the effectiveness of, of the different, uh, the effect of the, the different variants are on severity of disease or vaccine effectiveness. Very importantly, as you are aware, uh, you need a lot of data to be able to draw robust conclusions. And it is important for these data to be shared across Europe and beyond. And so we've set up the Europe COVID-19 data platform that where researchers across the globe uh, can uh, include their data, uh, which is important. We have raw sequence data. We also are developing, uh, funding the development of the analytical tools because sequencing is uh, one thing, but you need to make sense of, of these data. And importantly, through this COVID-19 data portal, uh, we are promoting the sharing of genomic, clinical, and epidemiological data. Next slide, please. Also important, you may not be aware of it, that uh, the, we have the European Innovation Council that has been mobilizing uh, its effort in the context of the COVID-19 economic recovery. And here uh, you will see several activities uh, have taken place, basically to, to uh, help uh, small and uh, medium-sized companies uh, that have innovations uh, in the make to help them to uh, mobilize these innovation, get the funding that they need, and so that the solution reach uh, the systems and the people that need it. Next slide, please. Of course, uh, the, the pandemic is a pandemic. <laughs> And so working only within a country or even within Europe uh, will not get there. Uh, that's why we are strongly supporting international initiatives uh, that address the pandemic. Next slide, please. As I mentioned to, to you, this GLOPEDA, this international network of research funding organization that invest in research preparedness and respond to infectious diseases. And that for the past uh, year and a half have mobilized around the COVID-19 pandemic. There are 28 members uh, overall worldwide. Next slide. 
and the Commission is uh, funding the Secretariat for that uh, partnership. And so it is the objectives are to support the development of research preparedness, but also to facilitate rapid and aligned funding of research in an emergency, for example, in the context of COVID-19, but also draw on, on the, the enormous potential there is if you link up not only the funders, but the researchers to be able to influence uh, the data, uh, the, the agenda based on the data uh, that had been collected so far. And Globeda works hand in hand uh, with uh, WHO uh, for looking at the research priorities identified with WHO. Next slide, please. And here is what's just uh, under GLOPEDAR and with uh, UKCDR, there's a so-called GLOPEDAR track, UKCDR GLOPEDAR tracker. It's basically a system by which uh, we are tracking uh, the investments made by the several research funders and check how these investments relate to uh, the research priorities. And this gives you a few of the numbers that are already included, focusing here on this slide only on vaccine R&D. Next slide, please. You are fully aware about uh, of the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, CEPI, that really has mobilized itself on creating this uh, pipeline uh, for the vaccine development, and our contribution has been uh, of 100 million euro. Uh, the, initially, the portfolio of vaccines uh, uh, focused on active candidates, and now uh, they're moving towards uh, also some ring fence funding to address the SARS-CoV-2 strain variants. Next slide, please. Here you, uh, you are probably have seen this slide. It's just to give a nice overview of what is in the pipeline under CEPI. Next slide, please. You are all familiar with the Innovative Medicines Initiative, but just to make sure that everyone is on the same page. Next slide, please. The mission of the Innovative Medicines Initiative joint undertaking is to facilitate open collaboration in research to advance the development of and accelerate patient access to personalized medicines for the health and well-being of all, especially in areas of unmet medical need. And the objectives are spelled out in more detail where you go from uh, improving the current drug development process to uh, uh, develop new therapies for diseases with high unmet need, example, Alzheimer's or AMR, and also to reduce the failure rate of vaccine candidates. Next slide, please. So an important element, uh, the funding, the total budget is 3.276 billion. And here it's important to keep at the back of your mind, it is a partnership with the industry indeed, with FPA. FPA companies receive no funding, no EU funding, but they contribute to the projects in kind. And the EU funding goes to universities, SMEs, mid-sized company, patients groups, etc. So this is a partnership indeed between the industry and EU, whereby the funding, uh, the company invests in kind, uh, and the EU funding doesn't go to the companies, it goes to universities, etc. as I mentioned. Now, next slide, please. In the context of COVID-19 uh, response, uh, IMI issued a specific calls focusing on treatment and diagnostics. Um, this is also in the context of uh, the work of CEPI that was focusing on vaccine development. And at that time, meaning a year ago, it was important, felt by everyone important to have complementary uh, activities and research uh, put upstream. Next slide, please. Now, uh, as I mentioned, we move on to the partnership on pandemic preparedness. Uh, this is new. Next slide, please. So here, uh, this partnership on pandemic preparedness, the discussions really took place because of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, and whereby uh, the member states asked for a better coordination between their investments and the commission investments around uh, preparedness research. And this was spelled out in the Aero versus Corona Action Plan that was uh, published um, back in April, 2020. But uh, independently or in parallel to this discussion with the member states, uh, there was also the scientific opinion where improving preparedness and management was flagged as an important issue to work with. So, 
partners, member states, and sorry. Sorry, I have a very active dog. Uh, uh, the partners, member states and European Commission should develop and agree on an aligned multi-annual agenda with common objectives for R and I actions in pandemic preparedness. So the idea of this partnership that is not there yet, but in the make, is to really align efforts around an agreed upon research agenda. Next slide, please. And here uh, we have identified with the member states three potential objectives to improve the EU's preparedness to prevent, predict, and respond to epidemics. Like I mentioned, develop the strategic research and innovation agenda, and then work towards a European research area in pandemic preparedness. Next slide, please. So we have identified five areas of activities for this partnership, potential areas of activities, gather new scientific knowledge, design and develop countermeasures, but also identify new strategies, research to identify new strategies for better and improved public health response. And what is uh, felt is very important that we have uh, uh, EU-wide infrastructures that can also reach out uh, globally. Next slide, please. So this pandemic preparedness partnership, the discussions have started with the member states and this process will continue in the coming months and years. We have another partnership and why am I talking about the partnership on transforming health and care systems. This session is also about partnerships and collaboration with the private sector and the public sector, but it is also forward looking. Uh, where we know that the COVID-19 pandemic has had a huge impact on our health and air systems. And this partnership, again, a partnership between uh, the Commission and the Member States may uh, help also address the recovery phase. Next slide, please. So uh, for those that are more familiar with this partnership that is in the make, it important, it builds on previous EU initiatives. It highlights a regional dimension. And uh, the partnership is quite ambitious uh, budget-wise because it's foreseen to have like 300 million euro, including a con commission contribution of 100 million euro. Next slide, please. So here, uh, what I wanted to highlight uh, is that very different partners will be taking place in this partnership. And that may also be the richness uh, because it, it goes all categories of end users but also national and regional decision makers of health and care systems. Next slide, please. And uh, what is the objective of this uh, partnership? To contribute to the transition towards more sustainable, resilient, innovative, and high quality people-centered health and care systems. And so here we will work on governance with the member states, improve national coordination, and of course, fund the research that then whose results will feed policy. Next slide, please. Uh, and here are the ways to keep in touch with us uh, in, in these uh, digital uh, ages. There are a lot of different ways you, you can keep in touch with you. Uh, and I would like to leave it at this and thank you. Thank you, Barbara, uh, very much. Um, and thank you to your kind dog for providing uh, their input as well. Um, I think this was a, a very comprehensive uh, view uh, of what has been going on uh, from the European Commission side. Very importantly, I picked up while uh, Barbara was talking this idea that, of course, we are looking at the European perspective, but these are also tools that can um, keep, take us to a global, uh, to a global level. Um, and I will now, before we move to the next, uh, to the spotlight speaker, first spotlight speaker, go actually back to Erika first for our poll results. Erika. Hello there. So Annalisa, if you could share the poll results with everyone. Um, uh, interestingly, most of the uh, people with us today, attending today, um, do agree that public-private partnerships are the solution for R&D and strengthening health systems. And the front leader in terms of the key takeaways that we know about so far um, are that uh, public-private partnerships are essential but need to be better governed. Um, and that new outbreaks will happen, so it is vital to build on lessons to ensure better response in the future. 
Okay, so through the thought, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. I think based on the title of the webinar, I don't think it is particularly surprising uh, that we get the, the responses that we did, but I do find the 31% uh, saying it is not uh, the case that public-private partnerships will be the, the tool um, or the solution of the future. Uh, very interesting as well. And I think we're really looking forward to hear from everyone, but and also from this group in the chat of why you think that is the case. But uh, first, we go to our spotlight speakers. Our first one, Vasi Murthy, the WHO. I think, uh, Vasi, you have a number of different uh, credentials and lots of activities um, in your career. I think perhaps most relevantly for today, um, your uh, position with the WHO and the blueprint and your experience with the Ebola outbreak. So please uh, give us your, your lights when it comes to that. Thank you. Thank you, Demetra, and thank you to the organizers for inviting WHO and, and me. I'm going to show uh, one slide, first of all. So this is a, a one slide overview of the progression of the, the ecosystem in terms of international organizations and relative entities that are relevant for product development. Um, and really the point is that in the MDG era, we have seen very, very major progress in the establishment of many enabling entities, um, Gavi, the Global Fund, Unitaid, and of course, CEPI are all really um, central in the context of, um, of COVID-19. But all of these are very important in different ways in the global health space. So I think that's, that's my first message, um, that there has been major, major progress uh, in this ecosystem. So then I'm going to try and share another um, three slides can you see a slide that says research for health department? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So just to say before going into the R&D blueprint, so as Dimitri said, I am one of the co-leads on the R&D blueprint, which is WHO's program to facilitate priority setting, convening coordination around emerging infectious diseases R&D, and we've been central in COVID-19. We also, with Dr. Tedros's transformation at WHO, have set up a new corporate research for health department which works on the same strategic public health research issues and, and framed in these five functions across the whole spectrum very broadly to bring this type of framework in other disease areas and not only infectious diseases, uh, this would include in NCDs. So this is a, a relatively new development at WHO. As part of this, we've been systematically looking at what WHO's role is across the whole pathway and the end-to-end -end process for medical product R&D. And this, obviously, I'm not going to go through this, but just to say that we're comprehensively um, looking at the role of different parts of WHO in different parts of this pathway. And this can also be seen as, as a circle, starting with the country and the community, patient, civil society perspectives in the top right, and then building into the assessment of unmet needs and WHO's role in interacting with various actors in medical product development. And then of course, our role in WHO guidelines and pre-qualification. Um, so I just, that's our strategic role in the space. Now, just to move to the, the, the particular question, the role, um, and I wanted to share some lessons learned from Ebola and then moving into COVID-19. So one um, story would be that in August, 2014, we were, um, kindly, there was a donation from the Canadian government of Ebola vaccine to WHO. And at that time, we didn't have the R&D blueprint, so there really wasn't a system for us to engage proactively in product development. So we worked with the actors and we did manage to work over nine months to go from the very first um, vaccination in a phase one trial to demonstration of 100% efficacy as a point estimate in the phase three trial. Um, but we had to do that without the supporting structure, although Gavi was there um, to work with already at that time. So just if we go from that um, in 2014 to now, we've seen the major progress. Many of the partnerships that the previous speaker has, um, has referenced, and the European Commission clearly has a, a major role here, um, the R&D blueprint, the existence of CEPI now, to major, major advantages that we have now in, in the system for bringing the private sector and the public sector to bear. Um, so I would say that's a big benefit, particularly vaccines for emerging infectious diseases, a lot of progress. There are some gaps that I would highlight 
in diagnostics, in therapeutics, we don't have necessarily all of the same enabling structures like CEPI. Um, in surveillance, in sample sharing, sequence sharing, there's still some work to be done in, in establishing the global systems that we need. We've also seen that um, while there's been inc astonishing progress in what industry has been able to achieve in moving from discovery to phase three trials in such short timelines, there's still more work to be done in the real public health use cases for, for these vaccines and other products and building that in from early in the development. So one dose vaccines, um, thermostability, um, really building in considerations about, for example, being able to move away from needle delivery, nasal oral uh, patches, uh, pediatric pregnant women um, considerations. And I think po possibly most importantly, how do we do better in terms of being able to rapidly scale to large numbers of doses? And then my final point would be, I think, again, we've made a lot of progress, but there's a lot more to be done in terms of building access considerations in from early in the R&D pathway. It is clear that we need to mobilize very large amounts of public sector funding, working with private sector entities. And in doing that, we need to have agreement on the conditionalities for the private sector to use this public sector funding to best enable access. And I think a lot of progress has been made, but there's more that can be done. And Dr. Tedros has talked about the alternative models that we could look to for um, public health oriented licensing along the model of the medicines patent pool, model coordinated technology transfer and matchmaking to ensure that all of the global manufacturing capacity can be used uh, most efficiently. So I think just to wrap up, what has been achieved in terms of the COVAX pillar, which we have to highlight as, as a major success here with WHO working with Gavi, Seppi and others, um, has been monumental, but the numbers of doses so far have been relatively small. And so we shouldn't rest on our laurels, um, but we need to continue to really advance further with the progress that we've seen over the last year and build on COVID-19 for the inevitable pandemic, which will occur so I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Vasti. And I think this is a, a great uh, bridge to our next uh, uh, spotlight speaker. We come back to a lot of, of, the, of the lessons you just talked about in the discussion section. So our next uh, spotlight speaker comes from the, from the side of the industry. Um, and we are very happy to have Marta Chlebos with us. She is the Executive Director for Scientific and Regulatory Affairs at FPA. Magda, if you could activate your camera and give us your perspective um, on how public-private partnerships have run during the pandemic. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Dimitra. And, and as other speakers, thank you very much for having me today and, and to shed some light on our perspective on public-private partnerships for R&D. I think what I would like to show is not just how it worked during the pandemic, but how actually past investments have helped and contributed to speeding up some of the translation um, today. So COVID, I think, as, as Barbara and Vazi said before, um, highlight both the need and the willingness of researchers from across the board, public and private, to work together. I mean, there is an unprecedented level of collaboration going on, and that unprecedented level of collaboration has made it possible, this miracle of delivering um, uh, the countermeasures that we, that we know about today um, and that are being deployed. The goal is clear for these collaborations. We need to accelerate the translation of ideas into health interventions and make research also more reflective of patient and, and health realities. And I think um, what the current crisis had shown very, very clearly is that no party can make it alone. There is very fast evolving science and technology, speed of reaction that it's needed in crisis time, call for an ecosystem in which uh, all parties are complementary. And I'm not using this buzzword um, just as a buzzword. This ecosystem is really a reality uh, that no one can deny today. And there are just yeah, three reasons for that. First, the speed of scientific evolution, nobody has all the knowledge. Um, it's, a, it's a patchwork of knowledge in various, in various places. We need to bring that together. And it happens that public partners and private partners develop those complementary 
pockets of knowledge. Second, to accelerate the translation, we absolutely need to test the hypothesis in uh, real life R&D, uh, like in medicines development program. This early engagement, and that's the third reason, will also impact on the replicability of science because we can show in those programs what works, what doesn't work very, very quickly. So it's a win-win. And these public-private partnerships really create speed and quality and, and uh, better, better quality products at the end. And the, the reason also for early engagement is that this old fashioned sequential approach simply doesn't work, it's not good enough. We cannot go, especially in crisis time, but beyond uh, speed is needed also in peacetime, not only in wartime. Um, we, we, need to, we, we need to depart from this very old fashioned way of, you know, I do my research, then I publish it, then I try to find a, um, a partner with whom I can scale up uh, and, uh, and replicate, etc. That's That's not good enough today. It needs to happen differently. And collaborations are happening across the board. They are supporting this. We have collaborations on standards and methodologies. They are essential. They are helping today this fast translation of ideas into products. We have infrastructure. Barbara very eloquently talked about it. And there are many partnerships and also product development in areas of global health in particular. So there are some important lessons from the current crisis. And there are, I mean, they are replicable, not just to other um, preparedness and response to epidemics and pandemics, but, but also in research in general and R&D in general. And past and current collaborations are really making the difference and such investments should definitely, I think if there is one lesson is that these investments, continued investments should be supported in the future too. So let me just give four examples or five examples of things on which we've built the current uh, acceleration. The AMR lab and clinical trials infrastructure have been paid for and created before. They are used today for COVID. Flu vaccine effectiveness data collection. There are some methodologies that actually look at how now can we look at the same in COVID. Preclinical and clinical data sharing platforms. All of these are absolutely essential and the systems built by the commission are not built from scratch. They are based on already existing uh, governance and methodologies and infrastructures um, that, can, that can be connected and deliver much faster than before with all the European research infrastructures and infrastructures built also in IMI. Tools that look at impact on pregnant and breastfeeding women, that was, that was mentioned before. And finally, let's remember that technology platforms such as those on which um, the Ebola vaccines was built in the past and mRNA um, on which now today the new vaccines rely. Um, here companies were investing for years in those for other indications and they came handy just in time because there was a continued investment and engagement. So by the way, most of these examples come from the Innovative Medicines Initiative or Horizon project. So where does it work now? Why do we need this engagement and how to, how to set it? So it works when the goals are clear and we are not talking about um, outsourcing, we are talking about partnerships today. So when the goals are clear and when the wins are clear for both parties, for all parties, where the stakeholders can inform the, that can inform the process or develop parts of the solutions are around the table, where the interests are clear and disclosed from the get-go, where we have a learning loop and agility to adapt and where there we have the scale and resources aligned. And these are really key performance indicators that make it possible to um, use those tools and accelerate the translation of ideas into, um, in, into products, into solutions, and this ecosystem where academia, SMEs, basic science, etc., work together, it's essential and should be supported going forward. Thank you. Magda, um, and then for this structured uh, lookout at the end, we move now quickly, we're slightly behind due to our technical difficulties, we move to our final spotlight speaker, and we're very pleased to have Yanis Natsis with us. Yanis leads the advocacy for better and affordable medicines at the European Public Health Alliance. You're also on the management board of the European Medicines Agency. Yanis, give us your outlook for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dimitra. Um, I have a slide, this will be shared with you afterwards as well. Um, I want to start by talking about HERA. Uh, this is the new agency, which, is, uh, which was announced already back in October by Ursula von der Leyen. But before I do that, um, I think 
thanks to COVID, members, uh, member states, governments in Europe uh, got to, to think in terms of R&D. And I think this is the good news. Uh, of course, now it's the time to deliver and, and really um, invest with serious amounts of money and with long-term strategic planning uh, in order to um, address the problems and the shortcomings that we are even now currently experiencing uh, and overall to say that Europe was not uh, really prepared uh, in, the face of, uh, in the face of the pandemic. So in my opinion, to look at uh, the HERA initiative is a great opportunity to really uh, move beyond and go beyond the traditional public-private uh, partnership, uh, partnerships. And I think HERA needs to be um, a, a truly public entity with a clear public health mission um, a, the, the public needs to act as a wise investor, uh, a, a wise investor who, who steers meaningful public health needs driven innovation, as opposed to simply throwing money at the private sector. Um, we need to go beyond the experience with the, the Innovative Medicines Initiative. We need to look into late stage development and manufacturing. We need to move from simply reimbursing the costs into procurement of the finished uh, products. Um, and of course, I agree with Magda, we need to have a clear um, division of, of tasks uh, with a realistic, as I said, long-term and sustained uh, budget. We don't want this agency uh, to be vulnerable or prone to political or uh, commercial competing uh, priorities. Uh, at the same time, I think it is important, and, and the COVID-19 pandemic has indeed highlighted uh, the need for affordable, accessible, and available uh, products. And I think today we see that there is a scarcity in supply. We see a grossly uh, unequitable access to the uh, existing vaccines. Of course, we shouldn't underestimate the fact that we do have multiple vaccines in less than a year, which is indeed a result of, of the public working very closely with the private um, sector. Uh, but it is important looking forward, we need to, um, in the, for instance, in the case of uh, estab the establishing of HERA, we need to guarantee the return, the, the public's return on investment. And this is why um, the, the public support, which I think we will all uh, agree is multifaceted and multi-layered, needs to be reflected into the um, purchase price. And I think when we look at, uh, when we talk about partnerships, we mean real partnerships, not just contracts. And I'm making this distinction because the, 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 the companies uh, will benefit from all sorts of um, public guarantees flexibilities, uh, but they will also have to uh, shoulder a fair share of the financial risk. And this is what I mean by um, a real partnership, just not a simple contract. It is a question of how do we share the rewards and the risks. The industries are obviously um, for HERA, but also beyond HERA, are indispensable partners. I think there is nobody who can contest that. But specifically for the establishment of HERA, I think that we need to go beyond the IMI experience and companies should not be on the governance board of the future European um, research agency. Um, and why am I saying that? Because you put your question at the beginning and you found that 31%, if I remember correctly, uh, were a bit apprehensive. People, our audience, our viewers today, they were a bit hesitant as to the public-private partnership approach. And I understand why. There is mistrust. There is also mistrust coming from public health uh, agencies who do not want to um, uh, join forces with the companies. Therefore, in order to counter this public-private partnership hesitancy and this mistrust, we need to really look at how can we strengthen the uh, transparency um, uh, and to uh, make the value proposition that at the end of the day, the fundamental public health questions cannot be answered and should not be uh, uh, um, allowed only for them to be answered by the profit-driven uh, private, uh, profit private uh, sector. Uh, I'll wrap up 
um, at this stage, and I think there will be plenty of time for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yanni. Um, we, yes, exactly, we're back into, into gallery mode. Thank you to all of our speakers. I would like to, to ask you to turn on your cameras, please. Um, our panelists, of course, not our participants. And there is quite a bit of, uh, of activity in the chat uh, with lots of interesting questions. We received questions ahead of the webinar, so we're really uh, pleased with your active participation. I will pass on to Erica to give us a first uh, taste of what our panelists should be talking about in the next couple of minutes. What's in the chat, Erica? Okay, so lots of really interesting things have come up in the chat, um, as you said, and ahead of time. So one of the issues which has come up is around um, easing intellectual property uh, uh, agreements. So are there any lessons that we should be learned from the COVID experience around potentially relaxing um, IP agreements so that countries can are free to produce more vaccines to co cover their populations and address some of the inequitable access um, to uh, vaccines uh, that we're currently seeing. Um, then there's also um, what in what ways might R&D also improve actual purchasing decisions in hospitals? That, that could be quite interesting. Um, and also, what about PPPs for prevention of epidemics and pandemics? So we don't actually need the vaccines. So is there a role? Is there a role there? Okay, so I'm interested to hear what your feedback from that. So I think, Erica, why don't we pick up from the last question that you asked? So how do we build on what we know now to ensure that we have structures in place to prevent the pandemic, maybe uh, not necessarily by developing vaccines or by being able to build on technologies that we already have, as we did to a degree uh, in the COVID-19 pandemic to quickly move forward? Um, let's start with uh, Barbara on that. I would say, and then we go to Vasi, who already alluded to these uh, points um, in his last uh, in his last couple of points of his spotlight. Barbara, first over to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's, it's very good point. How to go to uh, prevention and and prevent the next pandemic? And you can look at it from from different uh, perspectives. And like you mentioned, uh, vaccination would be one. But uh, uh, one of the elements that uh, we we would like to enter the discussion with in, in with the member states on this pandemic preparedness partnership that you would include the type of research that helps you do the kind of horizon scanning. Uh, horizon scanning in two ways: what is happening, what are the new threats about, and then what are the type of uh, technologies that we will need to have to put in place to uh, to, 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 to counteract uh, if a, a public health emergency or pandemic would occur. But importantly, I think there's a whole, um, let's say, uh, mobilization of society and, and what 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 is what can groups and communities do uh, to to be part of the discussions on how you can prevent the next public health emergencies I think that this is a very lively debate that goes uh, really beyond research but I think that this is something that where in the future we will need to draw some of the lessons learned thank you Thank you, Barbara. I think um, you raise a very important point. We will pick up pick this up later in the discussion that the focus of the webinar was originally on R&D and it's primarily on R&D, but it's not only research that we need to focus on when we talk about partnerships. But sticking to this question of preventing the next outbreak or mastering the next and the next outbreak as, as quickly as possible, over to you, Vasi, uh, for your thoughts. Thank you. I think this is in fact one of the biggest questions that humanity is facing, quite, quite frankly, whether or not we find some way of maintaining um, the interest of societies in pandemic um, prevention preparedness before the next pandemic occurs. Um, we coined the phrase disease X in 2017 in the R&D blueprint to make the point that we can never know which pathogen or disease is going to cause the next pandemic. And we have been calling for this work, but we haven't got much traction because I think politically it's it's difficult to get interest in something in a crisis before it occurs. And I always use the analogy of the fire service. Nobody says it was a waste of my money, my taxpayers' funds being used to support the fire station just because my house did not burn down 
or I didn't have a major fire. Nobody questions the need for a fire service. We need a global fire service that is funded and everybody needs to be on the same page. And I think the civil society groups and communities and, and patients and, and advocacy for, for the momentum to support this is absolutely what is needed. Because if we don't need that, what will happen, and I've been working in this space for a long time, is it gets flooded with money. There are short-term solutions, short-term projects, and then a year later, you nothing happens. I mean, that is the reality. So if we don't solve this, then the next pandemic could have a case fatality of 10%. And we have, in, in a way, this is a wake-up signal for the world. And I'm not a politician, so I, I don't know how to mobilize this kind of political support, but it goes way beyond the R&D discussion, and it is an existential risk to, to society. And there are, there are, we know a lot of the things that need to be done. Um, we have published uh, various reports. There are there was, there's always an epidemic of reports after there's an epidemic. And we can look at these reports. They have many recommendations which need to be enacted. I'm sure there will be a, no, a large number of reports after the COVID-19. The real issue is how do we raise this, this um, in the community that everybody needs to be supporting this? And secondly, how do we raise what is an equally important point that I, I'm sure all of the panelists would agree with, that it cannot be done on a national basis. It has to be done on a regional and a global basis. And we can all see now that the mutations are arising in other countries. So you can have 100 doses of vaccine delivered per 100 people in your country. And that in no way is going to address the issue if it's mutating in another country, it will come back to you with a, a variant that the vaccines do not cover. So unless we have a system which is global, and enables access globally, which we have a lot more we need to work on, building on COVAX, et cetera, then you know, we are in this situation of existential risk. That's where we are. Thank you very much, Fas. And I think one thing is raising it and the other thing is sustaining it, right? Because it won't happen maybe in a year or in two years. And we need to have longer memories than we actually do. So that keep it going for for as long as is necessary. But you raised, both of you actually raised the issue of community uh, being brought into this. And Yanis, I come to you um, as, a, as a member uh, of civil society. How do you see it? Yeah, I think it is important. And this is why I chose to talk about HERA because it's forward looking and it offers us um, a framework, let's say, to have this conversation. Uh, and, and why I keep referring, why do I keep referring to, to HERA? Because it really ticks all of the boxes of how we need to um, think in terms of big picture and as you said long-term planning strategic planning and this is why um, when it comes for instance to the the governance structure of a future EU agency which will resemble but will not copy uh, and paste uh, the US BARDA which was what actually triggered the conversation um, the governance needs to be open and inclusive uh, and it needs to and to be transparent actually um, and, and why? Because I think it is important, especially moving forward, we need, it's not a question only of perception. And in some cases, perception, the perception of independence, the perception of, um, of accountability is, is as important as reality itself. Uh, and this is why um, when I talked about the governance and how to set up this, this agency, and I think this is, it's a wonderful opportunity that we have to actually reflect uh, about these questions and about this uh, subject. It's kind of a clean slate, if you wish. Um, uh, it is important to, to get it right in order to um, counter this, this uh, mistrust which exists. And this is why I think, yes, it is a la mode, let's say, to keep talking about public-private partnerships. And obviously, public-private partnerships are part of the solution, but we need to get them right. Uh, we need to make sure that they are um, perceived to be driven by uh, the public health needs, uh, as opposed to some uh, narrow commercial agendas. Okay, uh, thank you, Yanis. This links also to one of the other questions in the chat. We come back to that um, in a minute, but we go to, to Magda with the same general question um, of ensuring that we move forward in a way that helps us prevent or manage the next outbreak quickly and maybe my uh, my uh, sub question to this for you is from your members do you feel like there is a reorientation in priorities for the next few years when it comes to research or how would you 
perhaps it's not too early to think about that because we're still very much in the current pandemic. But how, how do you see this? My goodness me, yes, it's, it's far too early to, to think um, about your sub question, but definitely I think what I would like to highlight again what Vaz said about this is a global, this is a global endeavor. This is not a one country endeavor. This is something that really needs to be tackled for from the from the global perspective. And you know, I remember very vividly when we were working on Ebola a few years back, as soon as the Ebola uh, outbreak went away. Um, preparedness went away. Nobody was thinking about it anymore. And I think if we have to learn just one lesson from that is, well, two lessons, let me allow. First is really to, to work on preparedness along the lines that, that Bazi and, and, and Yanni is actually outlined. We need to do preparedness, to think and brief preparedness. And second is to stop reinventing the wheel all the time. There are so many things that we have already done, created infrastructures, created networks. We need to capitalize on that and to connect it. I think this is, this is the, um, the great opportunity that we have today is to build on everything on which we have already invested before. Thank you very much. I think this is a very important point. It also echoes what Vasi was talking about, all the recommendations that have been written down before and are available and are available somewhere, but we just actually really need to use them and bring them together. Erica, back to you. We have a couple of uh, questions still unanswered from the first round. I was wondering if there is additional um, input from the chat uh, or from, the, from your emails that we need to be paying attention to. <laughs> yes. Um, so one is it's sort of related to the um, R&D issue in that it's about the uh, clinical trials um, for registration. And it's about how can we make the trial system more oriented towards public health? So if you so how can we include those groups such as older people and things like this to make sure that the vaccine is actually eff efficacious? In the groups that we're uh, targeting, um, and then this is this is a sort of very very hard question, so you don't have to answer it. But it's probably more for Vasi and Barbara. But it's what have you learned from Covax? So is there anything you would do differently next time? Okay. Oh gosh, and there's one more just come in. So, but yes, if you move on with that. <laughs> okay, I think um, the what have you learned from Covax links to one of the questions that you asked before. Is one thing is how we talk about it, and the other thing is what actually happens on the ground and how can we use the experience that we see from COVAX now to look into the future? Let's go to Vasi first and then we go to Barbara. Um... Thank you. So I think it's, this is the time to be ambitious in our vision for preparedness. And this is the time to, if you like, have a, I, I'm from a product development background. So people talk about target product profiles. We now already have what you could call the target ecosystem profile. We, we have from all of this work, what we need to put in place. And we need to systematically make the case for all of these elements. And a couple of the things that, that I could just speak a little bit more about that need to be put in place, lessons learned. I think from, we've seen actually more from therapeutics than vaccines, that um, it can even be the case that there are too many trials. So there are thousands, thousands of clinical trials of COVID-19 therapeutics. Most of these are too small um, to be useful. And they're, they're very well-meaning you know, really passionate principal investigators, maybe in one hospital that will do a trial and it's just too small. Um, so what we have seen is that there are some platform trials. There are probably only a single digit number of these in the world that have really have the governance system and the coordination system to have enough hospitals. We have the solidarity trial that WHO is coordinating where we're enrolling in over 400 hospitals in over 30 countries globally. There are, and there are some others, um, the UK recovery trial um, and, 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 and several others, uh, the, some from the US, um, the ACT um, system and, and others in, in Europe. Um, Remap CAP is, is another example. But the, these, my point is these really are the minority, but if you look at those platform trials that have been um, partially supported by the European Commission and, and some of the other groups, there's a lot to build on there for next time where we need to have research embedded into the healthcare delivery system so that there is a way that the national health systems can prioritize what are the absolutely critical questions for the priority clinical trials and the priority networks 
to do. And they have to be set up in a way that they can switch on immediately when there's an emergency. There have to be emergency procedures in place on the regulatory side, on the ethics side, to, and on the national and international research coordination side to make sure that we can answer the questions very quickly. So I think there's some really important lessons to be learned there. It's not how many trials you do, it's how many questions you answer in a way that is, can then translate into use, including suitable for regulatory submission. That's, that's one thing I think we need really as urgency to work on, including these emergency procedures for countries. Not all of the countries actually have emergency procedures that allow them to authorize a trial. And we saw, and, and it's interesting to me that this does not correlate with the income level of the country at all. There are some high income countries that don't really have good procedures. There are some middle income countries that have very good emergency procedures. So all countries need to work on that. And this is the time to do it. It takes some years to do it. Secondly, on the intellectual property, I mean, there was a question about this. And I think there is really a valid discussion to be had about how most of the money ultimately in these kind of areas will come from the public sector. The private sector does put some very considerable funds in, but ultimately we all have to make the case that the public sector has to fund this because it's, it's a, to avert a public health crisis. And that does mean, I think, we really need to think about how the intellectual property is managed. There are public health models for how the licensing can be managed. And I think in general, we would say that exclusive licensing from one scientist to one commercial entity is not the most efficient way to ensure access at the global level. Um, and I think there are a number of other lessons that we need to systematically go through the process of what those lessons are that can be learned so that we do not you know, make it the same mistakes next time. And that, that's just normal good governance. Thank you. Thank you very much, especially for the tagline at the end. Normal good governance is a very important thing to, to keep in mind. I will deviate from what I said before, Barbara, because I'm mindful of time, so I'm not going to come straight back to you. I'm going to go first to Magda, then to Yanis, and then end with you to give us um, an outlook for the end of the webinar. We will be a couple of minutes late, um, so we won't end at one o'clock, um, but I think it's very important that we hear uh, the final thoughts from all our speakers. So Magda, over to you. Uh, to pick up a couple of the points I saw you during uh, the previous uh, small contributions. Please go ahead. Thank you so much. And just to complement what, what has just been said on the platform trials, this is really a brilliant example where public-private collaboration is really important to set the infrastructures, the protocols, everything right, because these trials are not only supposed to look at the, at the products and interventions, they are also supposed to generate results that would be then evaluated by the regulators in order to register and authorize the products to come to the market. So the quality is also important, and this is where we can actually bring together the cultures, the knowledge, and set them up right for all the purposes. Um, on the question of, of IP, um, yeah, there are voluntary schemes which are, which are being used today. Companies enter into them. We have also to recognize um, that there has been a lot of past investments that are being capitalized upon now. I said, you know, the mRNA technology uh, was being developed um, for years, and and indeed um, uh, that needs to be that need to be recognized. And IP is not all. I think we we also need to see the role and time for technology transfer. And today it takes time, it really takes months to set up um, a place to uh, a manufacturing site for mRNA um, vaccine. So it's, it has to be, the, the response needs to be nuanced and it's a combination of voluntary schemes, investment in technology transfer and uh, collaboration, public private collaboration and engagement where necessary in order not to divert useful resources from where we need them most now, which is to manufacture as quickly as we can for as many people as we can. Thank you very much, Barbara, also for inadvertently answering one of the questions that we didn't have time to ask from the chat. Over to you, Yanis, for a couple of uh, final thoughts, briefly. Yes, just to say the IP discussion is, uh, is an important one. It's a very important one because we see the problems that we have today with the COVID-19 vaccines and the equitable access, the lack of equitable access. Um, this match, matchmaking, the contract manufacturing, governments should have used their leverage earlier, uh, six months ago, uh, in order to prevent a lot of the problems that we see today um, and in order also to hold companies accountable and companies are uh, indispensable interlocutors but at the same time we cannot expect them and we cannot beg them to act as um, uh, socially responsible corporate uh, let's say citizens 
uh, when we know that, and that's that's understandable, that one of their their key priorities is to to make uh, profit. Uh, this is why I think looking ahead, governments need to use their leverage um, if we are to de-risk private investment. And I think that's understandable and legitimate to a certain extent. There needs to be a guaranteed return on this public investment. The public investment is extremely important and very substantial, and it should not be um, ignored. Uh, and that, I think, is clearly illustrated by the COVID-19 experience. And this is why I think that the discussion in Brussels, uh, within the European Union, around the establishment of Kira, is an important one to, to help us to learn from the pandemic experience, build on and expand on the IMI experience, um, and uh, make sure that also governments um, uh, and the European Union as a whole act as, as a wise investor and as a real investor. So this is why I started off by saying that governments really need to invest money and uh, expect that not everything will be um, uh, a success. Uh, I think the lessons from the operation warp speed from the other side of the Atlantic, and in that case, it's a bar that driven public-private partnership, uh, shows that um, the, the possibility of uh, a failure uh, was built in from the very uh, beginning. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. This is a very uh, interesting example. And Barbara, now finally, I come to you for your final thoughts before we wrap up for today. Thank you. Thank you. Me. Thank you for this very interesting session. Um, what I take away from, from this session is, first of all, that uh, we have to draw uh, lessons from, from past investments before COVID. And as uh, Magda pointed out, and Sulit Vasi as well, a lot of work has been done in the context of Ebola that allowed for uh, the response that is there now. So, but then we the, the dynamics around the COVID uh, pandemic have changed, and we've been able to do things more quickly and achieve results. However, we should uh, continue the conversation, so to speak, because there are certain processes that have been put in place that have delivered but could be improved on, and we need to avoid that. Uh, let's say after this pandemic is over. The preparedness thinking moves away and we forget to, to work on data sharing standards, uh, te technology, manufacturing technologies that are improved on. Uh, so, so that is very important. And I think in all the partnerships, whether they uh, be public, public or public, private, it's very important to be very transparent of what is at stake and who can contribute to what. Uh, and, and this is something that, that we need to, because that's the only way that you can generate the trust, but also the, the clearness of what can be achieved to a certain partnership. And as you will have seen from what I presented, we are engaged of very, in various partnerships that have uh, each of them have their merits, but it's getting this global picture that is important and so that we're clear on how and where we invest. Thank you. Thank you. So if I sum up, clear rules of the game and experienced and form good governance will be the game changer. Um, I thank you all very, very much. I wish you all a very nice day. See you next week. Uh, thank you for being with us today. Bye. Thanks. Bye.